Oh yeah, I can hear it a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> my, um, oh my goodness. Okay, that's terrible timing here. <laughs> okay. But we are we are live now, so <laughs> um, hi everyone! Uh, thank you for tuning into uh, Sam Yamo Arts uh, online uh, book launch. Uh, we uh, have uh, a lovely um, uh, duo here tonight. Uh, uh, with us is author uh, Sandip Sodi uh, from Surrey. Uh, Sandip is uh, a uh, teacher and teacher librarian. Um, and we have Annika Sandu from uh, University of Victoria with us. Uh, uh, Annika is um, a teacher, uh, sorry, a student, uh, not a teacher yet, a student of art history and a very talented artist. Um, and in the background is our online marketing uh, coordinator, Ramnit, who makes sure that the technology um, goes well. Um, before we start, I would like uh, to acknowledge that our virtual book launch uh, tonight is uh, taking place on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded land of the Squamish, Quatsi, Quatlan, Semyamu, Slavertooth, and Musqueam First Nations. So, welcome Annika and Sandip. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, we were just uh, chatting a little bit uh, as a warm up uh, before uh, we went uh, live. And I was uh, telling Annika and uh, Sandip how fascinating it is um, for somebody who is not an uh, artist like me uh, to uh, look at uh, the end result of somebody's creativity when uh, they look at a blank page and then they fill it with beautiful words um, or beautiful uh, paintings. Um, and tonight uh, we are here to uh, celebrate uh, the launch of uh, Sandeep's uh, children's illustrated book, Talk to Me, What Do You See? So Sandeep, I actually read that you started your book um, three years ago, and correct me if I'm wrong, three years ago, but then you stopped and then you wrote your other book, which now is your first book. Yes. And talk to me, what do you see is actually your second book. So do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yes. Okay. About 2018, I had uh, had this idea that I wanted to write this book about an A to Z book about virtues or values. And I started writing and I got to that author's block, I think you could say, if you want to call it. And I couldn't go beyond that. So I put it aside. I said, okay, there'll be a time and place where the ideas will come. Let's just put it aside. And then all of a sudden, this idea came about, you know, my prior teaching years and how I might have engaged with the children. So I started writing that. And the ideas just came all at once. And um, so I figured, okay, let's work with this idea, with this story. And luckily, I met up with another illustrator who was, who was presenting at my school and um, he agreed to work with me. So we finished that story and then uh, got that one published in March of 2020. And as soon as that one was published, you know, the pandemic happened, we're sitting at home um, and I start, I picked up the A to Z book and all of a sudden the idea started coming back out again. I'm like, oh, but I'm going to switch it instead of a value-based book or virtues. I'm going to base it on things that I'm seeing with my family on a day-to-day -day basis when we're going for walks, listening to people's stories, and it's all going to be about simplicity and beauty that we have all around us. And so the ideas just poured out, and then it was writing, 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 and then obviously, you know, you write your first draft, second draft, and then, um, you know, you, you, I, I talked to some other people and tweaked some of the sentences, changed some around, until we finally got the end product. Okay. And, and even okay. for that, it was just like, okay, well, who am I going to, you know, have illustrate? And the way the illustration part came up is really exciting too, but I don't know if you want me to pause oh, for a bit yeah. or... No, totally. Yes, we 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 want to know how uh, this collaboration between Annika and you um happened. If you to knew each other before, how you trusted Annika, you know, with come with doing the illustrations, which is so pivotal. Like, uh, actually, um, you are uh, you are a teacher librarian, so you actually deal with uh, books a lot, books and children a lot. So you know. Um, what kind of books, uh, what kind of children's books are out there, 
would you say your uh, talk to me what do you see is it a picture book or a middle grade book or like what what audience does it cater to um, the funny thing about that is I think it's a book that caters to anybody from like age three until even adulthood. It's a unique story. Um, you know, you could say A to Z. It's teaching about the alphabet. So you can in involve the younger kids. But the messages and the illustrations that Annika did such a fabulous, fabulous job on them, um, they speak to everybody. They speak to how we've kind of overlooked how beautiful of a world we live in and all the positive things that are happening around us. So I'll give you an example. Um, my little kindergartners that came in enjoyed the story. And after it was actually, the book was presented at an assembly, a virtual assembly at our school. And one of the parents approached me while I was on supervision. And she said to me that she had tears in her eyes after she heard the book, because it was so fitting to what was happening in her life. And it just was read at the time that was meaningful to her. So here you have an adult responding to the book with tears in her eyes and a child who loves the illustrations. So I think it encompasses a whole different age group from little to old. I don't think, I don't think there's a limit to this one. And uh, so would you like to elaborate how you and Annika uh, uh, did this uh, collaboration together? Absolutely. Um, a funny thing is I've known Annika's family for many years now and I was speaking to her mom and I walked into her mom's workplace and I looked on the wall and there was this gorgeous, beautiful painting. And I said, who did that? And she said, Annika did it. I'm like, oh, I forgot that Annika was an artist. <laughs> and so I actually spoke to um, Annika's mom and I said, do you think she might want to work with me on a project? And um, her mom said, phone her and find out. So I took Annika's number, I called her, said, I was so excited. I'm like, Annika, do you want to work on a, on a book with me? And that's where it went. So I don't know, Annika, do you want to pick up on that? <laughs> I mean, I was really excited to, to get that call. That's not something I've ever done before. I've never illustrated a book before, really done the kinds of illustrations that I've done for this project. Um, like um, Sandeep just said, Uh, the projects that I worked on in the past and most of my artistic experience is in large paintings, um, more abstract styles, um, landscapes. So it was, it was a challenge for me a little bit to, to kind of change formats, but it was, I'm really glad it's been such a good experience and it's, it's something I've been really excited to take part in and I'm really grateful. And Annika, when you say you are actually more experienced in uh, large paintings, large paintings might be very different uh, than, you know, a, a book illustration uh, that also have really reflect. Um, and we are going to actually um, go over the book. Um, you know, there is like maybe uh, just one sentence and then you read one sentence that has three to five uh, words and then but then you come up with these beautiful um, illustrations that uh, hit uh, the nail so spot on how did you approach is this your first illustration that you did for a book uh this the pro the book is the first time i've illustrated for for a right. book so how did you come up with that? Did you, uh, with uh, Sandeep, did you two like talk a lot with each other and coordinated things or did Sandeep just let you do your thing and you showed her the end results? Um, how did you approach uh, the work as an illustrator for a children's book? And children's book, um, illustrations uh, for children's book are actually very important, right? It's different than writing an adult novel um, where you may just get away with not not having any illustrations at all except for the cover, right? But for children, um, they almost all have, I actually don't know any children's book that doesn't have illustrations because it's, you know, different, right? And maybe, Sandeep, you can talk about that, why it is so important to have illustrations in children's books. So maybe, okay, let's let's go. <laughs> okay, first, uh, um, Annika, how did you approach uh, your illustrations? I think it was a good mix of both. I feel like she gave me a lot of freedom to do what 
I thought would work um, while also inputting the things that she wanted to be added to the images, the things that she wanted to be incorporated. Like um, we talked a lot about diversity and about including different communities within the illustrations, which is something that's very important, I think, to both of us. Um, and I think that that was a strength of of the illustrations was that it did include all of these different groups of people. Um, and then, yeah, like um, if I sent over an image and something needed to be tweaked, um, she would make suggestions and we would work back and forth that way, which was really good. So it was very, very much a collaborative effort that way. And if, would you like to elaborate why it is important to have children, uh, illustrations in children's books and how the collaboration with Annika worked? Yes. Um, if we're looking at younger children, sometimes the pre-reading strategies that we're working on is actually talking about the images. They may not be able to read the words yet, but they can all talk about a picture. And that gives them the vocabulary, that gives them some sort of a background and allows their imagination to grow. So pictures are so important, it can spark a conversation so quickly um, from younger kids to older kids. So pictures, you zoom in on them, and then usually the text is an afterthought almost. Like the kids will see the picture and thoughts will be buzzing in their heads, and then you'll read the story. So um, I had some ideas, um, and the nice thing about it was when I, I spoke about the text to, to Annika, I told her what the storyline was about, she actually collaborated with me on the sentences too. So I'm like, how does a sentence sound? And she will say, well, why don't we, you know, use this word or, or try a different sentence or something. So the text was also collaborated on and it's, and I'd like to, to, you know, honor her in, and sharing that we've worked very nicely together and being open about this doesn't work, this works. And both of us were both were like that. And yet there's an age difference between us too. So that for me was such a beautiful thing to see that young people can work with older people <laughs> in, in a very collaborative, fun way. And we can get, you know, an end product done. But um, going back to the images, you know, Annika has got a very artistic flair to her and some of the pictures were bang on, like exactly what was going on in my mind. I had thoughts of, you know, can we make it very prominent, like the bees buzzing, for example, um, that it, they're such an important part of our life. So we have to showcase them. So she did them and she did others that were, you know, without me, my input, and they were just what I was thinking. Um, I think there were a few that were more abstract. And then I had to talk to her, say, you know what, we've got younger kids that won't understand that abstract nature of the pictures so we have to bring it more concrete or more realistic so that the littles will be able to see that and right away she took the the, the feedback and she re recreated so once again I'm very thankful for the openness in this um, project that we had and this uh, almost this synergy that we had going um, and sitting remotely I, she was in Victoria I was sitting in Surrey so we, we, this is the first time I'm actually seeing her in yeah. ages. <laughs> True. And uh, uh, so you mentioned the age difference between Annika and yourself, uh, but it worked out well. Um, so they say that you must think like a child in order to make a children's book. Did you consult... No, I don't want to say children, but did you consult maybe young, younger readers uh, for your book? Um, honestly, just tell you, I uh, for this book, no, because I've always been told that I'm very childlike in my mannerisms and my thoughts. <laughs> and everything. So not childish, but childlike. And so having worked with children for almost 27 years now in a school setting, it's almost become part of my nature. And it's that innocence or that simplicity that I get from the children that becomes part of my lifestyle. And I sincerely say that it's uh, it's such a wonderful experience going to work because I get to act like a child through their eyes. I see things through their eyes. And so that's become part of me. And so when I write, I'm think, I, I automatically have this lens on that I'm writing as if I were a child. What would I want to read? What would I want to see? Amazing. What about you, Annika? Do you think like a child? 
I'd like to think so. Um, <laughs> I yeah, no, I definitely didn't have any any access to to younger people here that I was able to consult. Um, but yeah, so it was completely just focusing in on my own inner child. And I think some of the some of the feedback from Cindy really helped with that too, because I did have to kind of rein myself in and think, okay, yes, this is for kids. This is something that I have to ensure is accessible for them and also something that they're going to enjoy at the same time. So getting into that mindset was a really unique part of this project for me. How long did it take for you, Annika, to um, make one of the illustrations? Um, it depends. Some of them, some of the ones that I had ideas for right away came very quickly. I, I did I did them in a way where I did drafts of some of them to begin with and then went in and did final copies. Others, I just did the, the paintings that you see in the book right away, straight onto the paper. So some of them would take hours. Um, the floral one, for instance, took, I think, at least two hours. Others were a little bit less time just because they happened to be more simple in nature. But um, over time as well, we were collaborating and, and sharing ideas back and forth. So some things did take longer with adjustments that needed to be made. So yeah, um, there isn't really a straightforward answer to that, but. It's a working process. Yeah. And you we are talking so much about illustrations and the text. And uh, if you don't mind, we should like uh, look at a couple of the uh, uh, case studies uh, so that people can have a look um, at Uh, some of the illustrations, I would say. Okay, let's see here. Um, so obviously, this one here is um, um, the cover. And Sandeep, I believe you, you uh, no, it was Annika who mentioned that diversity is important to both of you. And um, in, in the cover, um, how did you decide to convey your you know the importance of diversity in the cover which is the, probably the most important it's like the entry to the book right you you want to attract the um potential readers or buyers attention through the cover how did you two come up with this cover the cover idea and could you want to speak to that first or Do you want me to dive in or? Sure. I mean, I, I think I would start by saying that the illustration was done first for the letter A. Um, so that was the first image I think I did for the book was this one. Um, A body keeper, yeah. What the cover would look like and what the spine would look like and all of these different elements of the physical book. Then um, I had suggested that this should be the cover because just because of that. Um, diverse nature of the characters and the way that it encompassed the spirit of the book. So I don't know how that decision came about on your end, but that was where, that was what it was for me. And I think in, in the same sense that the diversity, seeing people of uh, different ethnicities, different um, physical abilities, different career choices that we're all in the human as humans, we can choose what we want to do. And I don't think um, it's in enough picture books. So it was very, very important to have something that you could reach to and say, hey, you know what, I can identify with um, being a mechanic, you know, I can identify with being a nurse. And I don't think there's enough books out there that show that to kids. Like there's, you know, the, the female doctor that's in the, in the picture as well of being of color. Um, it's very important for anybody to see their nationality, their, their background being represented as people that are also doing high skilled work as well. You know, um, as a child growing up, I was always, we, we can, this is going to be a little bit of a tangent, but, oh, you know, we came from India, we have, you know, parents had uh, farms and stuff. So automatic, you know, assumptions that, oh, are you a farm worker? And which is wonderful, we need farm workers, but it was always like, 
every generation, are you a farm worker? Are you a farm worker? Are you a farm worker? It's like, you know, yes, that's very important to us. It's very, a, a wonderful career choice to have as well, but we also can be present in different fields. And so it was so important that kids get to see that. The diversity that uh, you two are touching on and, uh, you know, that it is so important for you that um, children at a young age already learn that um, we are not uh, um, hetero uh, homogeneous, but uh, we are really diverse and everyone uh, can be something. Um, is an important aspect, and there, uh, as a star, the um, newsletter actually did a uh, statistics um, three years ago in 2019, where they contacted Canadian uh, publishers and authors to find out um, the, at the very least, you know, the um, cultural diversity um, of uh, books, of how it is reflected in children's books. And it's actually quite promising. Um, so um, they found out that 30.4% of uh, picture books for children depict white people, but 33.9% of picture uh, books um, depict um, uh, people of, you know, Black, Indigenous, um, East and uh, South Asian um, ethnicities. Um, and, but, and then when we compare it to the national average, so the last uh, Statistics Canada census uh, that was done in 2016, 22% um, of the participants self-identified as visible minorities. So actually in the picture books, um, more um, diversity is depicted than our national average. Um, however, sadly, um, while 22% uh, in the Statistics Canada census identified as uh, disabled, only 3.8% um, visibly disabled uh, people are shown in uh, picture books for children. And uh, middle grade, uh, it's even less. It's just 2.8%. Uh, so, you know, in that regard, we need to do some more work. But uh, with uh, cultural and ethnic uh, diversity in Canadian uh, children's books, um, it looks like, you know, we are uh, doing quite well. And your book, Sandip, is also a good example of that. And uh, uh, we were just talking about this illustration as well. Um, that would, you know, reflect um, the issue. And you were uh, telling me about how you came up with this illustration. So um, with this illustration, actually it was Annika's, illust the idea for the illustration was hers, but I had spoken to her about showcasing somebody in a wheelchair and she just incorporated the person into this image so beautifully. And um, I have a strong connection with this picture, um, although the, um, it, it's about exploring backyards, but it more, has more to do with the positive nature of an individual. Um, my uncle uh, was in a wheelchair pretty much since he was in his early 20s until he passed away. And I never, ever saw him um, sort of say, poor me, um, or that he couldn't do anything. That man went fishing. He went, um, he, he played or he did archery. He went to work. He drove a car that was hand powered. Um, he helped my aunt cook in the, in the kitchen. He helped with garden work. And so I had spent a, a large amount of time with him when we immigrated from England. And seeing that kind of a personality, the resilience, the strength in somebody who was fully able-bodied and then due to an accident was no longer able to walk anymore but not giving up it it just I think it it left an impression on my life and in my mind that anything is capable you're capable of doing anything um, but your mind has to be strong enough to do that and seeing that person in the wheelchair with the smile on her face and the image it takes me back to that time as a child where I got to see that firsthand and learn from those examples. So, you know, they're in their backyard, they're enjoying the garden, they're being friendly with one another. 
it's all part of that rich childhood um, experience that I had. So, um, and Annika, I just told her, you know, can we showcase somebody in a wheelchair? And she took, you know, artistic liberty to decide where that was going to happen. And it just fit really beautifully. Annika, why did you uh, put this scene in uh, the backyard? Um, for a couple of reasons. I, <laughs> the first reason being that I was trying out different ideas for images and trying to figure out what could go where. And once I started slotting in um, concepts that I had for each letter and looking at what letters were left over as I came up with things, this is one of the ones where I realized that showcasing um, an accessible space was also very important. And this image would help do that with um, the backyard and, and having that open door and the pathway and all of these things. And I think that when we're, when we're talking about um, disability and the visibility of disability, it's, it's really important to acknowledge that um, those accessible things are in place, whether that be in the image or in real life that we have places that take people's accommodations into consideration. So in terms of how this was all, laid out and how it was um how the um composition of the image turned out that was a big factor in that yeah and it turned out really great like i love the colors that you chose um and the, uh, the dimensions uh, the perspective it's it's really great okay let's go to the next uh, illustration that we were going to talk about imagining stories in our minds by the way, um, Sandip, how do you come up with this? So it's an alphabet book, and uh, it, each you know alphabet starts, um, each sentence starts with an alphabet. How do you come up with this great sentences? <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, you know, it's uh, going through the alphabet, and if you saw my my rough work in the beginning, I had letters of the alphabet and underneath each letter I had words that started with that letter and then it was just working with those words saying okay what would fit so it was almost like creating this grid in front of me and choosing what best word and then later I even put that aside and I just thought use your heart what do you see what do you imagine in your head and um and then, you know, playing with the language a little bit, are we going to have all ING words starting it out? Are we going to have past tense, present tense? How is it going to work? There is no punctuation in this because we want it to be sort of like a lingering idea, imagining stories in our minds. There's no period. There's no exclamation mark. It's just sort of, hmm, what, what thought is going to happen in your brain when you think of this? It, it's continuous. It keeps going on. Um, but it was... I guess because I'm exposed to so many uh, different books, um, children's books, and I read daily to kids that maybe subconsciously I start to absorb other people's writing as well. And then, you know, looking at that, I see what works with me and how I can convey a message to kids. So it's just almost this mixed smotch of, uh, of ideas and it's whatever works at that time. I mean, you know, my first few drafts and things when I'm writing, it's not, um, it's not perfect, obviously. And, and there we go through so many different revisions until we get to the point where, yep, um, this is how I see it. Or no, the sentence isn't sitting well with me. I need to do something else with it. And then it's reading to somebody else that's close to me that, you know, I can hear the constructive criticism. So it's, reliant on others too to get that feedback which is so important mm -hmm. yeah um so when you say that it's uh, important um to get the feedback how do you make sure when you talk to all these different people that your book um stays interesting but also becomes accessible to a wide range of um, readers um, and I'm thinking I'm not I'm not an expert but I'm thinking the um, age difference uh, when you're a child um, is more sig significant in how you your cognitive function um, is like when you like let's say 
you are just, you know, six years old um, and then an eight-year-old, there's, you know, a big difference how they perceive uh, looking at a book yeah. versus, you know, a 30-year-old and a 33-year-old. So how do you make sure that your book is accessible to a broader range of children? Okay, so that's a really interesting question. Um, I think these sentences from A to Z are things that we can all identify with. Like if you're thinking, imagining stories in our minds, a little kid might be thinking about, oh yeah, I'm going to be playing with my toys and I'm going to do some play talk and I'm creating a story. Whereas in my mind, it might be, I'm imagining a story. I'm imagining going on vacation, you know, when the world opens up again. So we're always creating these stories. Um, it's the it's how you take it. It's your own interpretation of it. Just like with any other book that you read, uh, you can interpret it differently than your neighbor that's going to interpret it differently than a child. Um, and I think keeping the sentences very simple, there's not a lot of difficult words in there, but it's, it's, um, I think it's the illustrations that add to it as well. So like, for example, what you just got onto jumping in puddles, Every mm -hmm. kid's going to squeal with delight saying, oh, yeah, I love jumping in puddles. But I'm sorry, I'm an adult and I still enjoy jumping <laughs> in puddles. <laughs> so um, I think it's I, I would think of it as a child and then I would apply it to my own life saying, OK, now could I understand that sentence? And then I would ask my husband or my daughter, you know, different age groups. What do you see in your mind when I see this? They're like, yeah, that makes sense. Or it's not baby issue. It's not, you know, it, it's, it's suitable for, for young kids, but a young toddler would probably enjoy that too. Yes, mommy, I want to go jump in the puddles, right? So mm -hmm. it's just a sentence that I think everyone can connect with. And that's the main word, that connectivity with the words. Connectivity. Yes, I like that. And uh, we are talking a lot about imagination and this illustration in particular Annika did a great job um, depicting, you know, these uh, four or five uh, words, uh, imagining stories in our mind. And uh, Sandeep, why do you think right now uh, during the pandemic, it is so important to animate children's imagination? Oh, it's um, being back at school or being back at work you ask children to, you know, come up with a story. And, you know, sometimes we often get like, uh, I can't think of anything. I can't think of anything. I said, well, if you allow your brain or your mind to grow in different ways, we can all create a story. Um, you know, if there's a bug crawling around on the floor, you could create a story with that. And we all take turns adding to those sentences. And before you know it, the kids are all laughing and they've got a story in front of them from something that they didn't even think they could write about. So it's, important for us to allow children to have that chance to explore their own creativity and their own imagination mm -hmm. um, and and guiding them and helping them out because once they get going there's no end to what they can they can make or, or mm -hmm. think about um, and in in this particular picture the sentence was there imagining stories in our minds but it was once again Annika who took that lead on you know, incorporating the indigenous family in this image. So maybe she would like to, to uh, elaborate on that. Um, yeah, I, that was something that was important for me to, to include, um, especially based on living in British Columbia and, and the communities that do live here and exist here and how strong they are, the presence in our culture um, as a province. And also just including them because those are a culture that tends to be underrepresented within um, children's media and our media that we see in our day-to-day -day entertainment. Um, for this particular image, I really wanted to show the family ties that exist and make a positive representation of family ties as well as showing the way that um, storytelling and imagination plays a part as well. And I did consult a few of my friends as well who are Indigenous. Um, oh, that's great. Yeah, that's uh, awesome. And what is the B about? What's that about? I think it was more about 
when I was doing this, I had this idea of um, interactions with the natural world, um, more so more active interactions than just the passive interaction of the child interacting with the bush, um, having another living creature um, being a part of the scene as well, and a non-human living creature at that, and having that also tying into conversations about our connections to nature um, during the pandemic, our responsibilities to the natural world around us. And um, that it all kind of came together in a very abstract way that I'm probably not giving (laughs) very much justice to by talking about it, but um, it was important to show different um, representations of of cultures within Mm -hmm. yeah according to the stars uh, statistics uh, only 6.1 percent of children's book uh, depict indigenous people so you're right Anika they are underrepresented what is this um what is I'm curious about this earring Uh, is that a result of your consultation with your friends this is an earring that actually, I don't know if I have it here with me, but it's um, one of my friends from the visual arts program at UVic. Her sister has a company, um, which I believe is, oh my goodness, I'm not remembering the name of it right now. Oh, Three Sisters by Emma. And she sells these beaded earrings online and I purchased a pair from her. Um, so this is a very rough rendering of of that pair of earrings that this um person from vancouver i believe Mm -hmm. yeah okay um this book uh, is um in a very bizarre way it meets uh, absolutely the zeitgeist of our time of of how we are in this pandemic and Annika you just mentioned the importance of you know the nature preserving our environment um diversity and there is also another uh illustration that uh, personally I liked a lot uh, which is this intergenerational um encounter uh so Sandy would you like to um explain why you wrote young people helping the elderly and how that how you came up with that idea yes um you know when you're going through the alphabet you're once again i was going through young young what could i do and then the idea of uh looking around again and we take it for granted how quickly we can leave the house go get things do things that we need to do and it made me think about what about our elderly neighbors or our family members that are homebound or or home and are afraid to go outside or are not able to go outside because of the fear of the pandemic or just generally failing health? Um, we, you know, I come from a uh, a culture which emphasizes that we should always be respectful of our elderly and that we should always be helping out in some way. And I'm like, well, I should go back to my roots and see, am I helping the elderly? What am I doing to help my seniors around me? How am I seeing other people helping others out? And we would have conversations at home saying, you know, um, auntie is home by herself. Did anybody deliver any groceries to her? Or did anybody check in with mom? Does she need anything? So things that maybe we had let slip we're starting to come back again. This need to reconnect with um, extended family members, with our seniors, finding out if they're okay. Um, I can get in my car, hop around, go get what I need to, but it, they may not always do that and how lonely they might feel. So being empath- empathetic and trying to think what might they be going through. You know, this is <clears throat> happening in a lifetime, but they probably didn't even expect that this would happen either. And um, as a senior, you're thinking, oh, I'm cooped up in the, in my house. I've got no way to bring things for me. And this one also is, is a personal um, sort of a, a sentence as well, because my own mother, she was stuck at home. My mom didn't drive, so she was almost reliant on her children dropping groceries off, coming in, checking in to see if she was okay. And then when we couldn't even go inside our houses, we're sitting on the balconies outside or phoning 
And she's thinking to herself, oh my goodness, my, my world has become, it's gone from being a, a busy social place where people would can come and go to, hello, I'm home by myself. Who's checking in on me? So it's so important for us to, to honor the people that are our, our mentors, our seniors, and not just because of the pandemic, but it's a reminder that we need to actually to, to reach out and help in whatever way we can. And even kids at school, you know, they would talk about their grandparents and um, how they felt sad that they weren't with them or that they were in a different country or um, um, how the grandparents were teaching their younger, the, the younger kids how to do things. So that sharing of care, sharing of knowledge, sharing of respect. Hello? Hi, Lily. Oh, oh, I'm so appeared. sorry. I don't know what happened. <laughs> That's we okay. lost, uh, yeah, we lost, uh, I don't know, I think I, or maybe I lost the uh, internet or something. So sorry about that. <laughs> no, it's okay. Oh, my God. Yeah. No worries. <laughs> um, but you were, t you were talking about uh, your uh, grandmother and how the intergenerational um, connection was important. With with my mother, yeah, with my mom, um, and also oh, just sorry, yeah. about no, no, it's okay. Um, in our in my background in my culture, there's a huge emphasis that we, you know, we we watch out for our seniors. You know, parents were there for children, help them, you help raise them, you know, grow up, whatever. And then we don't leave our seniors at the end just because they finished their job. Right now, it's our turn to help them out again too. So it's almost like this cycle that we go through and that cycle should always keep spinning where we're always helping, um, being thoughtful, learning from each other and taking the time just to listen to our seniors as well. So, and that too goes with so many, you know, it, it interlaces in so many different cultures with our first nations and learning from the elders there. And then, you know, in the Indian culture as well, the grandparents have a lot to offer, um, you know, uh, learning from tasks, skills that we may have forgotten. So they have a lot to offer. And it was sad to see the loneliness that was starting to, to hit home with so many of the seniors. And that's why that one is so important, right? The young help, helping the elderly, but it's our turn to help them. They've always been there for us. Would you say that uh, uh, with the pandemic, our um, ability to have empathy and uh, understanding for those who are maybe not as fortunate as we are in various ways uh, has grown? Um, have we become better people with, during the pandemic? I think if we're, you, you, it's that's a tricky question because I was talking to, you know, a lot of people about this topic. And if we have the resources, if we're not worried about food, you know, living um, conditions and all that, then it's easy enough for, for us to say, yes, we have grown. Our empathy has grown. But for those people that are still struggling with those things, it's their basic needs have to be met first. Mm -hmm. So it's easy enough for me to say, yes, I think my empathy has grown or my sensitivity towards people has grown. But then I look at, you know, somebody who might not have a home or might be struggling on the street. Are they going to be able to have that same level of change in their empathy? So it's a huge question. And I can only speak from it from what I see in myself and my own family. But it would be wrong for me to generalize, I think. You know, that, that phrase that keeps saying that we're all in the same boat and, you know, people post that, no, we're not in the same boat. Some of us have got dinghies, some of us have got yachts, some of us have got canoes. It's a different situation for each person. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the pandemic has shown the, especially the economic divide that exists in our society very well, huh? Yes. Um, but you, in your book, in through your words and through your Anika's illustrations, I do think there is a warmth uh, that comes uh, by looking at the pictures and reading uh, your words. You you both managed really well to um, publish a book that is so simple and yet so promising and um, gives uh, one hope. 
um, you know, looking at your book um, uh, gives one a hope that uh, a uh, there is humanity despite all the struggles that we are going through, and uh, b there is a um, light at the end of the tunnel. So you, I think you both, you know, you managed very well. Your collaboration uh, was a good, uh, was a fruitful result. Yeah. Um, I would like to talk about uh, the aspect of um, you, Sander, being an author. Um, so apparently, children's books um, are more robust in terms of selling, <laughs> selling points than um, adult books. Was that one of your motivations why you uh, published two children's books or was it, what was your motivation? That's no, you know what, it's um, actually, I never even thought too much of the sales and I'm being very, very frank about that. To me, it was to get these ideas that have been stuck in my head out and whether it was going to sell or not, that was a secondary thing. For me, it was, I want to create a book. I want it to be out there. If even one person reads it, I've done my job. I've, I've got my, my creativity out. Um, selling it, actually the first one, I am not keeping any of the profits for that book is, you know, my expenses will be paid for and all the extra, the net profit is being donated to um, Canuck Place Children's Hospice. Um, Wonderful. Giving Wonderful. back to the community, right? And I think with this one here, this, this one, I'm going to actually have to hold on to some of the funds so that I can fund my third book. <laughs> There's a third book coming out. Great. Yeah, your third book coming up, yes. <laughs> we look forward to it. By the way, um, you can uh, purchase Sandip's book by Amazon and also on her, you can directly order her book on her uh, website. And I hope uh, Isaiah puts uh, Sandip's uh, website on the chat so that uh, our viewers can uh, click on the link and... Um, go directly to your website to purchase Fantastic. it. <laughs> yes. Actually, Uli, it's also available. The uh, Mischievous in the Classroom is available at the Kids Books in Vancouver on Broadway. And both of the books, I'm happy to say, are going to be available at the South Surrey um, Indigo in Grandview Corners. Oh, great. Uh, and I know uh, Annika's working person. with me. Okay. Yes, in person. Yeah. And Annika's also working very hard on getting them in the Victoria in Victoria and the different book shops. I just have to do my part and fill out the paperwork. Yet. <laughs> well, Annika, if you need help, we have a very uh, dedicated and uh, smart uh, University of Victoria co-op students working for us right now. <laughs> they can maybe help you. <laughs> we can uh, put you in touch. Um, yeah, that is uh, great uh, to know. Um, and uh, Sandip, so you, this is your second book. You are going to publish a third book. We can say you are a uh, seasoned author uh, <laughs> by now. Uh, and you work in the library uh, business. And you're a teacher, children's teacher. Um, what a thing should aspiring authors consider before writing a children's book? So when, you know, let's say I'm Uli and I want to become an author yeah. and I want to, you know, publish a book and I'm thinking, shall I write an adult, you know, crime book yeah. or shall I write an illustrated um, children's book and get somebody talented like Annika help me what would you uh, tell me <laughs> what I should would, I consider <laughs> I would say who is your audience number one who's your audience okay so you're saying children's books what message do you want to deliver to them and that for me was crucial like in both books there was a message there was a reason why I wanted to write this book um the first one was about oh you know when you look at behaviors in classrooms and, you know, difficult things that substitute teachers might have to deal with. So that was, nailed it, right? You know, the kids laugh at going, oh, self-regulations, this is how I'm supposed to behave. So in my mind, it was like, without giving kids a lecture, how can they, in a humorous way, learn how to behave? So there was a reason why I wanted to. And in the second one, the, the main message for me in that was, you know, we we all need to appreciate even the tiniest little things that are beautiful in our world, which sometimes we forget and we, we strive for the stars or we, we're reaching for the stars, but we forget about all the little, you know, the dew drops that are on the leaves that we forget about. And those are all beautiful things. And if we bring it back to um, this, the simplicity of the world, the beauty of the world, it's, it's a calming feeling. 
you know, it's that mindfulness, um, teaching kids to be mindful. That's so important these days. It's in the little things. It's, it, it's in the tangible things. It's the things that they can actually grasp and see and do every single day. So my advice would be, again, why are you writing? Okay, what is in your heart? What message do you want to convey? And if you're really passionate about it, it's going to come out naturally. Mm-hmm. Yes, like in your case, with both of you, Annika being the illustrator and you being the author of, uh, of the book, um, okay, if uh, if we are uh, all right, it's, it's okay with you and uh, Annika, if you don't want to add any more aspects um, about the book. You uh, actually, Sandip, you mentioned your first book. What is it? What's the title? The title is called Mischievous in the Classroom. May I show it? Sure, I've got a yeah, 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 yeah. It'll probably be upside down, but here it is. It's oh. Mischievous in the Classroom. It's okay. about this teacher that... Uh, you know, works very well in her own unique way with a class that's difficult to manage. And it's an illustrated book as well. It's an illustrated book. It's a more of an animated book, whereas the one with Annika, um, it was more like realistic. It was paintings, right? So it's a different kind of an artwork that went with the mm -hmm. story. Mm -hmm. And I think it was fitting to the style of book. Okay, and it's self-published. It's self-published, yes. Both of them are self-published. Good. Okay, so we have a question uh, in the audience. Uh, Sandip, did the illustrations match what you had imagined while writing or did the drawings come as new visions for your writing? Oh, okay, no, you know what? I would say that they matched what I was thinking in my brain. And the ones that didn't, we discussed and they were tweaked or it was, it was, it was bang on. Like, I cannot believe how, gr how grateful I am. I'm going to repeat that again for having had the chance to work with Annika because it was like, she went into my brain and she could see what I was thinking, or maybe it was the vibes that she was giving off that I incorporated into my own brain. <laughs> yep, that's it. <laughs> And without actually meeting in person, right? That's the amazing part, that you never actually met and sat on a table together. It was all virtual. Yes, yeah. yeah. So, but maybe because you guys uh, know each other for so long, that's maybe, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Could be, yes. Yeah. Okay, um, we also had a draw on our Instagram and uh, we have a winner. So the idea was uh, you uh, like and share and uh, you uh, tag uh, two of your friends uh, in the post uh, for Sandip and Annika's uh, book. Um, and uh, the winner of uh, the copy of the book is uh, Carmen Molina. So congratulations, Carmen. Uh, you have uh, won a copy of Sandip's book and we will uh, get in touch with you and uh, send it to you directly. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. All right, then. Um, is there anything else, uh, Annika and Sandip, that you would like to add about your book uh, mention? Actually, if I could mention one more thing about it. Um, I did a little experiment with some of the kids. I covered up the writing and I asked them what the images conveyed to the kids and they had to share their ideas their connections and I was thrilled to see that even kids that were in grade seven which you know use they don't they don't want to participate or whatever their hands were going up saying oh you know this reminds me of a time when or I remember doing something and so it opened up that conversation to a point where I had to tell them okay you know one at a time Mm -hmm. in turn. So again, in this pandemic, when people are withdrawing, they're kind of coming quiet by themselves to have something that allows people to speak and to help them speak. So this is also like a springboard for, for conversation. Springboard for conversation. Yes, I like that. Yeah, I am. I, when I looked at uh, your book, uh, just, you know, the simple sentences, I was thinking it's actually maybe even an invitation to write more, you know, like yeah. under the sentences, just whatever you imagine. Or when you look at Annika's illustration, what else comes up in your mind? Maybe match uh, 
the first letter of the alphabet uh, to, and then make another sentence. So yeah. It's an inviting, engaging uh, book, I would say. Thank you very much. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Okay, then, Annika, is there anything you would like to add? Um, I think just on a, on a, as a conclusion to everything, um, one of the things that I, I do think is really valuable about this book is the way that it showcases the communities that we live in. Um, and I think that something that I worried about a lot while I was illustrating it was whether it's going to look too much like a college brochure, you know, as people say the stereotype is where you're just trying to mash in every issue and every piece of diversity that's in there. But um, one thing that I, I did understand as I was doing it, and one thing I did try to keep in mind was that this is what the community around me looked like when I was growing up in Surrey. And when I was um, going to school with people, these were the people that I would, see. these were my classmates, these were my classmates' families. And I thought that was really important to to put into media because I think it is very important for for kids to see themselves in their very limited scope of the world and and for other people to see as well that this is what the community looks like. It's not just one, like you were saying earlier, one homogenous thing. So that's something I'm really. Would you say? Would you say? Talk to me. What do you see? Is is that? Is this book a very Canadian book in your opinion? Personally, I think it's. I think it's very representative of the Canada that I knew growing up. Being in Victoria, obviously, is a very <laughs> different situation than than Surrey in that regard. But um, I think it is very indicative of how Canada is made up of so many different types of people, whether that be ethnicity, um, different family structures, different physical abilities or disabilities, and the way that, generally speaking, Canada strives to be representative of all of those things. Yes, and we are celebrating Asian Heritage Month and Jewish Heritage Month in the month of May which uh, shows, you know, how conscious Canada as a nation is towards um, different backgrounds, different, yeah. Mm. So the so diversity is uh, very uh, striking in Canada, especially for someone like me who comes from Germany, where everything is just one culture. So <laughs> I do appreciate the diversity here. And your book does reflect it very well and in a very positive way, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, then. So I have to apologize for the glitch. <laughs> I wanted to show more illustrations, but I'm scared that there is another crash. So I think we should leave it at that for now. Uh, you know, people are invited uh, to purchase your book uh, on uh, a brick and mortar in uh, Surrey, South Surrey, or online on your website, Amazon. Uh, so there's, you know, different possibilities. Is uh, uh, your book going to be available at the library as well, Sandip? Mischievous in the Classroom is available at Semiamo Public Library in, in South Surrey. And I'm working on getting the um, ABC one as well. I have once again to do the paperwork um, linked to that. And I will be speaking with the public librarians to hopefully get that there. Um, and uh, the other thing I wanted to mention is I would love to hear feedback from people. If you were to go on my website, there is an area for comments or just, you know, talk to me. I would love to hear from people. For sure. We will again post your uh, link your web, to your website so that people know where to go, okay, mm -hmm. um, and uh, engage with you. Yeah, I think feedback is a good idea for their third book. <laughs> Great. Yes, thank you. I'm, I'm trying to get it into um, the various different public libraries in Surrey. Um, Vancouver, unfortunately, is not accepting any um, independent authors at the moment, any, you know, um, books that where they can't purchase online because of the COVID thing. So I'm hoping that once things lift, that that's going to be another place where we're going to be able to have the book. Yeah. 
And then uh, uh, for sure also White Rock Library, right? Yes, yes. The White Rock Library yeah. should yeah. you should try as well. And then uh, Annika, you are in Victoria. There is libraries there, I believe. Yeah. People in Victoria read. <laughs> no, just kidding. Yes, they read. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we can, I, there's a there's a little bit of paperwork that has to be done in order to get the books in the library. So it, it's coming. Hopefully it's coming. <laughs> Let us know if we can help. OK, thank you so much. As uh, Samia Marks. All right. OK, well, it was lovely to talk to you, Annika Sandip, uh, to uh, talk about your book, your inspiration um and go through the go over the illustrations and the sentences it's always interesting to know how um creative people like the two of you come up with what they do um how their brain and mind works and oftentimes when we listen to the talks there is a lot of serendipity and a lot of um uh you know the collaboration meeting the right person at the right time, like it happened with you two, um, and then a fruitful result uh, comes out of these encounters. So that's an interesting aspect as well. Sure. Right. I wish you to 